Hello. All right. Good morning. Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> um, thank you for joining us for this quick shot oncology session. Um, we just want to have a few instructions. Um, please, um, if you're coming up to ask any questions, please state your institution and um, your question for the record. Um, also to remind presenters that they have two minutes for presentations and two minutes for questions. So this is a quick shot um, session, so everything will be done in one hour and we will yank you off the stage if you're not on time. <laughs> Lastly, um, people who are grading for the quick shots for the awards of distinction, if you can bring your score sheets at the end of the session up to us and we'll collect them. And then um, lastly, just to, in the effort to save time, if you, during the question period, if the next speaker can come up and get ready, that way we'll um, be efficient. So thank you again for joining us. The first talk is Pediatric Clear Cell Sarcoma of the Kidney, a report from the National Cancer Database presented, presented by Dr. Malik. Thank you. Hello, and thank you for the opportunity to present our work. I have nothing to disclose. Uh, pediatric uh, clear cell sarcoma of the kidney in uh, the pediatric population is quite rare. It accounts for 2 to 5% of all pediatric renal malignancies. Um, and in the uh, a period beyond infancy and before the uh, second decade of life, it's um, probably the second or third most common um, pediatric renal malignancy. Uh, treatment is multimodal, including surgical resection, multi-agent chemotherapy. Uh, and uh, radiotherapy in all stages above stage one. Uh, our objective was to use the National Cancer Database to uh, describe the incidence, characteristics, and treatment strategies, as well as outcomes in pediatric patients with clear cell sarcoma of the kidney. Uh, one of the reasons for this is that there's very little, little uh, in terms of large data on um, CCSK. Uh, there's a few uh, studies out from National Women's Tumor Study Group, uh, which are excellent, but uh, nothing had been done uh, of this nature previously. Um, so we, uh, the NCDB, that uh, database we uh, uh, reviewed, it contained 10, 10 years from 2004 to 2014. There were 11,637 pediatric patients. Um, 122 had clear cell sarcoma of the kidney. Uh, we differences in survival were analyzed via log rank tests and multivariable for um, independent um, risk factors. So we found that uh, the age was on average about two years. Um, Caucasian uh, was most prevalent in terms of race. Uh, about only 10 um, 10 percent of patients had metastases. Um, surgery was performed in essentially all patients. I'm not sure why that's not lining up, but um, chemotherapy was uh, is received by all patients. Nearly all patients receive radiation, which makes sense considering that uh, almost all stages except stage one should receive radiation. Um, and uh, about 64% um, were negative for lymph nodes with 16% positive. Uh, our one-year survival in the NCDB was 97%. Five-year overall survival was 92%. Um, and on multivariable analysis, the presence of lymph nodes was the only um, predictor of uh, mortality. So in conclusion, CCSKs are rare malignancy with favorable outcomes, although the outcomes are um, not as good as they are for stage-matched favorable histology Wilms tumor. That is why they get more intense chemotherapy. Uh, and the absence of lymph node invasion was the only independent predictor of uh, survival. Um, this is limited by the fact it is a retrospective analysis, and um, unfortunately also there are a number of missing data points. And also the NCDB is all committee on cancer hospitals, so many freestanding children's hospital, hospitals are not included in this data. Thank you, and I'll take any questions. All right, we have time for one question. Yeah. Do you, all right, I'll ask a question. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have, so you know that CCK um, has an increased incidence of brain metastases compared to other renal tumors. Did you guys have any data on the incidence of brain metastases? No, so actually we didn't have um, any relapse data from this, so unfortunately not, but I mean, it's, it's obviously a great point and important to follow these patients with imaging of the brain, particularly if you suspect relapse. Thank you. Thank you. Our next presenter is uh, co presenting complications following nephron sparing surgery for Wilms tumor. Going to be presented by Dr. Spiegel. Hello, my name's Rosie. Um, I want to talk to you today about complications following nephron sparing surgery for Wilms tumor. Um, this is 30-day post-op complications. 
So as the use of nephron sparing surgery is being increasingly encouraged in these patients, it's important to assess um, complications in nephron sparing surgery to gain a more comprehensive view of the risks of this approach. So for our study, there were about 60 um, nephron sparing surgeries that underwent um, Nephron sparing surgery at St. Jude from 2000 to 2017. Five patients were excluded due to concomitant radical nephrectomy, um, and the following data were collected. Um, both intraoperative blood loss and positive margin status frequency were significantly increased in patients that underwent nephron sparing surgery, as you can see here. Um, there was, oh, that's weird. Um, prolonged urine leak was the only complication that was found to be significantly more frequent following nephron sparing surgery as compared to radical nephrectomy. Um, UTIs and rates of infection were comparable among the cohorts. Um, while there were differences among the sites of recurrence, the overall frequency of recurrence was comparable to radical nephrectomy as well as overall survival was not significantly decreased. So um, despite nephron sparing surgery be, being um, associated with a more complicated perioperative course, um, it does not ultimately result in greater recurrence or decreased overall survival, and this allows for greater preservation of normal renal parenchyma, which may ultimately lead to improved renal function and should be considered in appropriate patients to optimize long-term renal function. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Davidoff and the St. Jude team for their support and their guidance, and I'd like to take any questions you have. Dr. Graziano. Uh, Van Leeuwen, oh, no, actually, sorry. sorry. <laughs> she forgets. <laughs> Kathy Van Leeuwen from Phoenix. So at our institution, we use a multidisciplinary approach because we have Mike Ritchie, who's kind of a big guy in Wilms, and he's in urology. Do you guys use two disciplines or two divisions, or is it all pete surgery? Do yeah, so I think that uh, the majority of the time we have a urologist, um, Dr. Gleason, from the University of Tennessee um, to consult on these kinds of cases if necessary. Um, but for the most part, I think the surgical team takes the lead on that. I have a quick question. Yeah, um, so uh, the fact that you guys have positive margins obviously necess necessitated increased intensity of therapy. Do you have you used frozen section in the operating room to help uh, prevent that positive margin? Um, yes, I believe so. I'm not exactly sure the occurrence of how often that is used, but uh, I know that it was. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. So next is 3D printing for the surgical planning of nephron sparing surgery for bilateral Wilms tumor, presented by Dr. Huniman. Good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to thank the program committee for the opportunity to uh, share our project. Renal failure is a known long-term complication of bilateral Wilms tumor, and nephron sparing surgery has a well-established role in managing these patients. In the most recent children's oncology group study of bilateral Wilms tumor, the stated goal was to achieve a 50% rate of bilateral nephron sparing surgery. In the final analysis, the rate was only 39%. To increase the rates of bilateral nephron sparing surgery, the authors mentioned the possible options of regionalization to specialized centers or central patient review that would include technical guidance. Our question is, can 3D printing help with the preoperative planning of nephron sparing surgery and bilateral Wilms tumor? So 3D printing or additive manufacturing is the process of creating a physical object from a digital file by sequentially layering material. This technique has advantages of portability, speed, and fidelity that differ from other manufacturing techniques such as machining or molding. Our case is a four-year-old female diagnosed with bilateral Wilms tumor. Following neoadjuvant chemotherapy, her restaging CT scan revealed a single large left-sided uh, renal mass located centrally and appearing to involve the collecting system. The right kidney had two smaller masses involving the upper pole of the kidney. To create our model, the CT data was segmented into discrete volumes representing the parenchyma, vessels, collecting system, and tumor. These volumes were used to create a composite 3D computer model, which was then printed in resin and painted. Assessment of the model suggested performing a single partial nephrectomy on the right kidney would unnecessarily remove normal tissue and would require entering the collecting system. However, the lesions were both compatible with individual minimal partial nephrectomies. For the left kidney, the model helped us recognize that a partial nephrectomy would leave a large defect in the collecting system that would potentially not leave sufficient tissue for reconstruction. Using the model as a tool, the surgical plan was explained at length to the family. It was also used to facilitate education and discussion among the pediatric surgery team. The patient underwent two partial nephrectomies on the right and a radical nephrectomy on the left due to extensive intraoperative involvement of the collecting system as was predicted by our model.
In conclusion, 3D printing is useful in the surgical planning of partial nephrectomy. For future directions, include applying 3D modeling and printing to more patients and establishing patient-specific training models that allow for purposeful practice prior to an operation. Thank you. I'll start out. I have a few quick questions. Um, what's the time frame it takes from getting your imaging to print the model? And then what are estimated costs with this? And then a third quick question, are there other <laughs> tumors which you've used this technology for? So to first questions, the turnaround time is going to depend on what your institution has. So we had a 3D lab that was just getting sort of started, um, but they were already printing. So, you know, we met with the radiologists and the team there. They segmented it. It took a few days uh, and it does take a couple, good couple of hours and it does take a certain expertise at both interpreting the, the CT scan as well as creating these three dimensional volumetric data sets. Um, but the turnaround time is a, is a few days. Okay. Uh, the printing is actually fairly quick. Startup cost for a 3D lab, if you don't have one, can run up to you know ten to $20,000. The printer itself, this was a fairly cheap desktop model that's available for you know three to $5,000. Uh, the individual cost for the model was $20. Wow. Dr. Ehrlich? Uh, two things. One, <coughs> another adjunct, uh, which has been done in in the Netherlands, and I, I've used it, and going there is to use it, take those models, and there's a virtual reality, and put it into a HoloLens that, for teaching, that allows you to look at 306 degrees separated and look down on it. So you really get that, it's an addition to that model, but it gets it, and you can actually use that while looking at the CT scan. And the other thing is, there's an H. Oh. <laughs> I'm very sorry. <laughs> Jonathan Karpulowski from Sydney, Australia. Yeah. One of the other modifications we've taken is we've actually created a negative mold of the tumor, mm -hmm. cast gel, and that gives us the ability to actually do practice runs on it where we increase the consistency so that it feels like the tumor. So we've done that with both livers and kidneys. So that's another way possibly to do it than rather just using the resin. That's it. And just to address Dr. Ehrlich's uh, point about the 3D, the virtual reality. So this central, I lost my, my pointer, but the central picture here is actually the 3D volumetric reconstruction, which allows you to subtract the different volumes. So you can actually remove the, uh, the kidney parenchyma and look at the collecting system, look at the tumor in, in cooperation. Uh, I don't know what the startup cost for the VR system would be, but it's, I'm sure there's, a, there's an added cost there as well. Yeah, okay. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Our next talk is Outcomes After Local Therapy for Liver Metastases in Patients with Favorable, favorable Histology Wilms Tumor, a Single Institution Study, presented by Dr. Heaton. This is the wrong slides. Does Dr. Kim want to come up and give her a talk? <laughs> <laughs> and I remembered the H, Dr. E. <laughs> <laughs> This is talk 32. Last name was? With an H. Yes. <laughs> you want to tell a joke, Todd, while we're waiting? Sure. <laughs> so these two bilateral wolf tumors walk into a bar, and oh, that's a problem. It was uploaded earlier today. Okay, why don't we go on to the next talk? And then we can we'll do it at the end. Yep. Cool. All right, uh, Dr. Kim, you want to come up here? Our talk is on renovascular hypertension in children, surgical management, and outcomes at a single center interdisciplinary program, presenting by Dr. Kim from Boston Children's. Thank you. Renovascular hypertension in children may be secondary to isolated renal artery stenosis or mid aortic syndrome characterized by aortic stenosis with varying involvement of visceral and renal arteries. It presents usually as hypertension, but extreme cases can lead to organ failure and even death. And here, we present our surgical experience for renovascular hypertension at a single center interdisciplinary program. To do this, we performed a retrospective chart review of patients who underwent surgery for renovascular hypertension from 2010 to 2018. 
And surgical procedures included traditional ones, as well as two novel bypass procedures utilizing the patient's own vasculature. Developed their institution called MAGIC, or Meandering Artery Growth Improved Circulation, and TESLA, or Tissue Expander Stimulating Lengthening of Arteries. 36 patients were identified, 26 with mid aortic syndrome and uh, 10 with isolated renal artery stenosis. Median age at presentation, at diagnosis, and surgery were 5.4, 6.8, and 9.2 years, respectively. The most common indication for surgery was hypertension refractory to medical management. Surgeries included five MAGIC, four Tesla, 10 PTFE bypass, one allotransplantation, two isolated nephrectomies, and 14 autotransplantations. The majority of patients have stage two hypertension preoperatively, but at median 1.6 years follow-up, 25 patients, or 76%, had normal blood pressure. Patients were also on median three antihypertensive medications preoperatively, and only one at most recent follow-up. Nine patients underwent additional surgeries, and seven underwent transcatheter interventions after their index procedures, and there were no mortalities. So in conclusion, pattern of vascular involvement leading to renal vascular hypertension is in children's variable and complex, and surgical approach is individualized, utilizing an interdisciplinary approach. And when indicated, surgical intervention can significantly improve hypertension and prevent its associated long-term morbidity. Thank you, and I'd be happy to take any questions. I have one question. Um, if you add the numbers that had to undergo reoperation or interventional Interact, um, interventional um, reoperation. Mm -hmm. It's about a third of patients had complications. Mm -hmm. What was the reason? Uh, so actually, the um, the patients that underwent reoperations and transcatheter interventions are not mutually exclusive, and oftentimes they were um, in the same patients. And a lot of and the re, um, the the reoperations are you know they're very variable. Um, several of them were early Tesla patients. We had the tissue expansers that were dislodged kind of within the um, the learning curve, and um, so that was earlier on. And then some of the other ones were more standard, like small bowel obstruction, um, just uh, more regular surgical complications. Thank you. Thank you. Has your technique evolved over time? Um, you know, over the past seven years, using you, do you use Tesla or Magic more frequently? Uh, yeah. So um, I think. Uh, I, I would say it's more that it's uh, it's more individualized, so they're kind of used for uh, a little bit of a different patient population. Um, and so now um, uh, we look at ind each individual patient um, and decide what they're um, more suited for. So depending on that, it's yeah, it's still variable and evolving. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So the next talk is perioperative outcomes after hepatectomy in children and this quick analysis presented by Dr. Utria. Thanks for the introduction and thanks for the opportunity to present. Although uncommon, liver resections are sometimes necessary in children for benign and malignant reasons, uh, the most common indication being hepatoblastoma. Current knowledge regarding uh, perioperative morbidity is based on data from small <coughs> single institution studies. So our aim was to describe perioperative outcomes after pediatric um, resec hepatic resections uh, using the Nescop database. So we used the years 2012 to 2017. We pulled cases using the CPT codes for partial lobectomy, um, left hepatectomy, right hepatectomy, and trisegmentectomy. We then further classified the partial lobectomies as minor resections, whereas the other three were major resections. We analyzed patient, disease, treatment-related factors, and 30-day outcomes uh, using statistical software. We had 458 patients that we extracted from the database. 50.7% um, of them were male, 66% white. Uh, the majority, not the majority, but the most common procedure was partial lobectomy, 47%, um, and the most common indication was malignant at 62%. Pediatric surgeons were performing the overwhelming majority of cases at 93%. Comparing minor and major resections, we found that um, males were more common, major resections were more common in males, younger patients, uh, white patients, and the indication was more commonly for malignancy. Length of stay across the board was seven days. Um, the complication rate was 20%, reoperation 8%, readmission 8%, uh, transfusion was quite high at 51%, and uh, death was low at four, uh, four patients, 0.9%. 
we did find that major resections had a longer length of stay and more transfusion, but otherwise we didn't see any difference in terms of complications. <coughs> so in conclusion, to our knowledge, a study analyzes the largest series of hepatic resections in children. Hepatic resections can be achieved with low mortality rates. Complication rates are similar for minor and major resections. Pediatric surgeons are performing the majority of cases. Blood transfusions are common. But further investigation is needed uh, to look at contributing factors of adverse outcomes um, to advance the care of children undergoing this type of surgery. Thank you. Papers open for questions? Dr. Langham. Max Lang in Memphis, thank you, and thank you for doing this. This needed to be done. So the safety part of it we've got, um, there's probably no data at all in this clip about efficacy. Yeah, so unfortunately the, the pediatric NESCOP database doesn't have anything that's um, specific to most pediatric procedures, whereas the adult database does have sp specific complications for hepatic resections. So yeah, there's not much there. So based on your work, would you uh, suggest that for rare cases, including uh, pediatric tumors, that there be some other measures inserted in this clip that would help us with this type of research? I definitely think it would be helpful to be able to discuss bowel duct injuries in um, cases where you just take too much liver and they end up in hepatic failure. So yeah, I think um, it would be definitely very helpful. Were you able to look at, um, so that you know, the incidence of blood transfusion is high in this clip, you can usually tell if it's 25 per kilo or greater. Mm -hmm. Would, did you look at that at all? So the, the volumes are there and we do have the weights. I haven't looked at it, but it's a really good suggestion. Thank you. Thanks. Our next talk is progressive accumulation of mutations associated with hepatocellular carcinomas in patients with congenital portosystemic shunts, presented by Dr. Tirasakis. Tirasakis, thank you very Sorry. much. We have no financial interest to declare. So congenital portosystemic shunts, often referred to as the Abernethy malformation, are a multi-system disorder that have multi-system complications, of which we will focus on hepatic tumors. These are usually benign, as in focal nodular hyperplasia or hepatocellular adenomas. However, their malignant and premalignant counterparts are well described as well. What we performed was next generation sequencing on the tumors and the background liver to identify any present mutations for a panel of 52 genes that are implicated in hepatocellular carcinomas. In our 46 patients, we found that 21 of them had mutations present and had liver tumors. We found that more severe shunts, complete shunts, were far more likely to have a tumor than patients that had partial shunts. To be able to determine whether or not the shunting is the cause for the mutation or whether mutations are present in focal nodular hyperplasia in children because next generation had never been performed, we also had a similar size control group of patients that did not have shunts nor liver disease, however, had FNHs. We found that the predominant gene that was affected by mutations was the gene coding for beta-catenin, the key regulator of the wind pathway. Specifically, HCCs and well-differentiated hepatocellular neoplasms all had mutations of this gene. Adenomas were mutated in 80% and FNHs in 73%. Multiple mutations were found in patients with more aggressive tumors, as one might expect, and this was statistically significant. Now, in our comparison with our FNHs to the control FNHs, we actually found that in the CPS FNHs, 73% did have mutations of the gene for beta catenin, whereas no tumor that was sporadic had this mutation. And this was obviously statistically significant. Now, to conclude, FNHs in patients with CPS are genotypically different, as are the rest of the tumors, and they have a higher predisposition for mutations in the gene for beta catenin. And this might provide a mechanism for increased malignant potential of those tumors. Furthermore, that mutations do tend to accumulate as tumors progress from benign to malignant on this spectrum. Thank you very much for your time, and I'm open to questions. Oh. 
Um, so on your patients that have uh, these congenital portal systemic tumors with the Abernathy malformations, do you suggest um, any sort of surveillance um, in terms of ultrasounds or things like that to watch for the development of something that may look malignant? Uh, without any doubt, surveillance should be done often by ultrasound and if not by MRI because sometimes these tumors do have overlapping features of adenomas and FNHs. Now, the key thing is actually to close the shunt. Uh, we do find that those patients that had their shunt dealt with at a younger age and who presented younger actually were far less likely to develop tumors because the time exposed to portal venous deprivation did impact the likelihood of actually developing a tumor. And certainly mutations are more likely to accumulate over time, so closing the shunt will have better outcomes for the patients in the long term. Jonathan from Sydney. Um, the FNHs that had the petite beta catena mutations, were those all resected specimens, or were they just core biopsies that you may have had of those? Because sometimes it can be challenging, and you may have, in fact, been dealing with adenomas rather than FNH. Correct. So the majority were actually from resected specimens. Uh, however, some were from core biopsies. Oftentimes, actually, we had a few patients that had a core biopsy uh, taken. The mutation was identified. And later on, they had need for a liver transplant or a further resection due to an evolution of this tumor. So that sort of gets at my question. Tim Lotz from Chicago. Um, in the patients who had the shunt closed but did not have the masses resected, have you followed the sort of natural history of those masses? Do they regress or do they persist? And if they are shrinking but don't regress completely, have you biopsied any of those to see if the genes look different at that point? Great question. Uh, actually, uh, about a third of them regress completely, a third of them get smaller, and a third stay the same size. Uh, we did have one patient that was a warning tale that following closure of the shunt, one tumor regressed nearly completely. and. It was a tumor that we had found a mutation previously, but didn't have so in the subsequent resection. But in the resected specimen, we did identify a HCC that developed and was actually a four millimeter nodule. So it must have developed after closure of the shunt. But in general, there is a tendency for resolution of these tumors and possibly even some of these tumors that are mutated following closure of the shunt, but they need very careful uh, follow-up. Thank you. The next talk is uh, Primary Mesenchymal Tumors of Liver in Children, a population-based analysis of a rare pediatric tumor, presented by Dr. Tran. Good afternoon. I'd like to thank the Society for the opportunity to present our research. We have no disclosures. Primary liver psychomas in children are an extre extremely rare malignancy. Outcomes and prognostic factors have not been well elucidated. Currently, there are no definitive guidelines for the evaluation and management of children with primary liver sarcomas. As such, the objective of the study is to evaluate outcomes um, in children with uh, primary liver sarcomas. We used to see our database identify children with malignant uh, sarcomas of the liver from 1988 to 2012. Demographic factors, tumor characteristic, and long-term survival were evaluated, and both univariate and multivariate analysis were performed to, to determine predictors of survival. We identified a total of 88 children with primary liver sarcomas. The median age was eight, the majority were Caucasian, female, and 40% had localized disease. The majority of patients had poorly differential or undifferentiated disease, and about 70% of children had tumors greater than 10 centimeters. In terms of histology, the majority of children had embryonosarcomas, and about 70% ended up on resection, 30% minor hepatectomy, 32% major hepatectomy, and 2.3% underwent transplantation. In our survival analysis, we found the five-year survival was 80% in children who underwent resection compared to no surgery, which was only 31%. When you look at the extent of disease, we found that the five-year survival was 83% in those with localized disease. Those with local regional disease had a five-year survival of 75%, and those with distant disease had a five-year survival of 38%. In our multivariate analysis, we found the extent of disease, distant disease, was associated with poor survival, whereas those who underwent hepatectomy had a uh, favorable survival. 
In conclusion, contrary to previously reported historical outcomes in those with primary liver sarcomas, surgical resection should be the mainstay treatment in children with primary liver sarcomas and is associated with favorable outcomes in those with localized local regional disease. While most children who succumb to solid malignancies do so because of burden mass cell disease, palliative resection can offer a survival benefit compared to no resection. Thank you for your attention. So I have a, a quick question. Um, so you grouped all of these sarcomas together. Um, they are very different and they were treated very differently. So the chemotherapy susceptibility for rhabdomyosarcoma is far different than it is for embryonal. So did you look at the biology of the disease and the, the actual histology in terms of response? No, uh, uh, given the SEER data, it didn't have granular data on chemotherapy, the types of chemotherapy, and the vast majority of the patients in the cohort had a embryonal sarcoma. For the other histologies, there were uh, too few of them to do a subgroup analysis. Dr. Hayes Jordan. Andrea Hayes Jordan from uh, UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, thank you for that report. You mentioned in your last bullet in the conclusions about the resection, but did the SEER database have any information on the difference between R0 and R1 resections? Because in the COG data, when we looked at the non rhabdo soft tissue sarcomas and the liver sarcomas in particular, there was a significant difference in outcome in the patients that had a R0 versus an R1 resection. Unfortunately, SEER does not have that data. However, it's, a, it's an area of interest of mine, and we're looking to um, we hope to look into this with the NCDB, which does have R zero R one data. Thank you. Thank you. Our next talk is uh, Zika virus as an oncolytic treatment for hepatoblastoma, presented by Dr. Mazar from Morse. Great. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, I have nothing to declare. Let's see, what's this? There we go. Okay. Uh, so, hepatoblastoma is the most common liver uh, cancer in uh, primary liver cancer in childhood. Uh, it typically affects children uh, from infancy to about the age of five, typically appears in the first 18 years of life. Uh, despite increases in uh, diagnosis, treatment therapies are largely the same for the last 20 years. Typically, you resect the tumor and use chemotherapy to try to shrink the tumor prior to resection. Oh, I'm sorry. So the survival rate can be very good if resection is early, but obviously if it consumes the entire tumor and metastasizes, the survival rate becomes very poor. So uh, our approach was actually uh, involving Zika virus. So Zika is, a, uh, is part of the uh, virus family of Flaviviridae. Um, it, it was originally uh, isolated in the Zika forest of Uganda in 1947. It's an uh, envelope and icosahedral uh, virus, and it's actually single-stranded positive strand RNA. Basically, it's a messenger RNA. Uh, most cases of Zika uh, lead to mild uh, symptoms, basically a mild form of dengue. And there's evidence, obviously, that Zika infection can cause microcephaly and other brain malformations, typically in uh, fetal children. Now, our own previous research uh, suggested it could be used as an oncolytic therapy for, uh, for neuroblastoma. And so we actually were presenting this as a, as a potential for hepatoblastoma as well. Now, our previous research suggested that um, in Zika-sensitive uh, neuroblastomas, which were the vast majority of them, we could actually wipe out the, the neuroblastomas in three days or, or less. Um, but we found resistant ones, actually, as well. And so we wanted to determine whether uh, the hepatoblastomas would respond in a similar fashion. What we found is that they were also extremely sensitive to the virus, also over a very short period of time. Now, the reason originally was uh, from next-gen sequence when we had parsed out that a gene called CD24, which is a cell surface marker, was responsible for this sensitivity. And what we found was that in, in uh, Zika-resistant neuroblastomas, expression of CD24 was extremely poor, um, whereas in the sensitive ones, it was very well expressed. So we found in hepatoblastoma, also CD24 was very well expressed, often uh, better than even in neuroblastomas. So what we went about doing then is simply knocking down expression of CD24 in our hepatoblastoma cells and examine the results. What we found is that in normal cases, hepatoblastomas were wiped out by day three, um, whereas with knockdown cells, we could actually expand that life expectancy to about day five, so almost double the period of time. So definitely CD24 was uh, particularly relevant for sensitivity. We also showed that uh, CD24 significantly decreased the rate of cell death when, when knocked down. In other words, it was necessary for the virus to kill the cell using CD24, either as a manner of uh, entry or as a matter of uh, replication in the cell. 
Now, we also did uh, in vivo work with Zika in mice. And what we found was after four week tumors, we could uh, inject a single time with very low dose of virus, basically 2,000 or 20,000, uh, allow them to uh, infect over a period of about three weeks. And what we found was, so with no Zika, the tumors would form very beautifully. But uh, when Zika was introduced, a single dose, we could get as much as 70% necrosis in a three week period. In addition, the tumors themselves were actually encased in dead tissue, and so they could no longer further um, uh, expand or metastasize. We found this at actually a two to 10 to the third and two times 10 to the fourth. Mind you, the typical dose we find per mil for Zika is about 10 to the sixth. So this is literally a mosquito's bites worth of virus. So in conclusion, uh, we find that hepatoblastoma cells are particularly sensitive to, uh, to Zika virus in much the way that neuroblastomas are. And it is, uh, appears to be because they express CD24. Loss of CD24 will give them resistance to the virus. So we suggest that would be prognostic actually for it as a therapy. Uh, in addition, we can see that in vivo, we can get significant necrosis over a reasonably short period of time with a very small amount of virus. Uh, our future directions also include uh, doing this not just in our NSGs, but also in nude mice. And I'll take questions. Dr. David Off. Yes, David Off from Memphis. Uh, so, can you tell us about CD24 expression in other tissues uh, in yeah. mice and humans? And did you sure. look in your mice? Um, to see whether you could find virus, uh, even if it wasn't replicating, sure. uh, it, at other sites. Sure. So CD24 is typically expressed in developing cells. So you can find it in hepatoblasts, neuroblasts, nephroblasts, and so on and so forth. It's usually very well expressed, but only in the intermediate phase. In other words, it's there during the, uh, the period of maturation. But once a, a cell becomes mature, it's no longer expressed. So hepatocytes don't express it, but, uh, but hepatoblasts will. We found a similar situation with neuroblasts versus mature neurons. And the, cell, the, the virus is, uh, appears to be evolutionarily optimized to particularly target this particular uh, cell surface marker and use it, we, oh, sorry, we believe as a means of entry into the cell, but it also could be potentially assisting in replication inside the cell. CD24 can be expressed in the ER as well, and since the ER is where you're going to be translating, uh, since Zika is a messenger RNA effectively, that's where it's going to head to. Okay, one more so. quick question because we're running out of time. No. Actually, my mind might not be that. Okay. That's a, go ahead. Sure. Right. Well, actually, uh, as for the mice, what we find is is, is that um, you can get Zika virus in the mice, but actually the Zika has really no effect on the mice at all, even in NSGs. So a significant injection into the mice and they're totally fine. There's no background. Thank you. So this, uh, as in um, all of our APSA sessions, each session is it has a video <laughs> tribute. Um, this session is dedicated to Dr. Bill Sieber, who was an original organizing member of APSA. The video was uh, prepared by Dr. Dave Lal and Jerry Zhao from the Children's Hospital of Wisconsin. William Carl Sieber, better known as Bill, was born on September 21st, 1919 in Ford City, Pennsylvania. He graduated from Peabody High School in 1936 the University of Pittsburgh in 1939 and graduated AOA from the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine in 1941. After graduating from medical school, Dr. Sieber served in the U.S. military during World War II as an Army captain. He was stationed in Cheshire County, England for nearly four years, where he primarily cared for injured German prisoners of war. After the war, he obtained an internship at Boston City Hospital in order to work with Dr. Dwight Harkin, a pioneer of cardiac surgery. While performing a bronchoscopy, Dr. Sieber contracted tuberculosis and was confined to a sanitarium for two years. Afterwards, Dr. Harkin dissuaded him from pursuing a career in cardiac surgery. He therefore left Boston and returned to Pittsburgh where he completed his general surgery residency at the University of Pittsburgh in 1950. In 1951, he married his wife Anne, an anesthesiologist at the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. Together, they had three sons, Kurt, Fritz, and Carl. Soon, Dr. Sieber began a busy practice in Pittsburgh, caring for both adults and children. Gradually, he transitioned his practice to caring only for children, primarily at the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. Dr. Sieber performed the full breadth of pediatric surgery, including urology, with an interest in bladder extrophy. 
Pediatric Surgery Fellows describe Dr. Sieber as technically facile, always professional, and a tireless advocate for his patients. Dr. Sieber would oftentimes travel to the Middle East to train pediatric surgeons in Egypt, Iran, and Beirut. This picture was taken in 1978 on a visit to the American University of Beirut, where he performed a bladder extrophy on a one-month-old child. Dr. Sieber was an early advocate for pediatric surgery to become its own specialty, distinct from general surgery. Similarly, Dr. Sieber recognized the need for a professional association that focused solely on the surgical care of children. He was actively involved in creating the American Pediatric Surgical Association, and one of his proudest professional accomplishments was being nominated twice as a candidate for the presidency of APSA. Dr. Sieber and his wife, Anne, were early members of the Lilliputian Surgical Society, a private, invitation-only society of surgeons focused on the advancement of pediatric surgery. This photo of Dr. Sieber was taken in 1990 during his retirement after practicing for 40 years at the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. He is remembered as a scholar, military veteran, humanitarian, skilled surgeon, and teacher to a generation of pediatric surgeons. Additionally, Dr. Sieber contributed extensively to the creation and ultimate success of APSA. All right. Next is consolidated cancer care does not provide benefits for survival or readmission rates in children with metastatic neuroblastoma, presented by Dr. Laris. All right. Thank you for uh, the opportunity to present our uh, work here examining the provision of care for children with neuroblastoma. We have no relevant disclosures. Uh, consolidated cancer care is uh, generally considered to be an improved means of providing care for uh, patients with cancer by consolidating multiple treatments into one central facility. Uh, proponents of this uh, means of care uh, promote uh, benefits including uh, more expedient care, more cost efficient care, and improved clinical outcomes for their patients. However, these treatment centers are uh, oftentimes difficult to access for patients who live in rural America or even urban Americans who uh, have difficulty accessing transportation to reach these centers. To examine the uh, benefits of consolidated cancer care, we chose to identify a cohort of patients who would receive multimodal therapy uh, with neuroblastoma. We did that by using the National Cancer Database. We identified patients with neuroblastoma who received surgical care, uh, radiation therapy, and chemotherapy. Here you can see our cohorts of patients. On the right, you have the consolidated group, which received all three of those therapies in one central location. On the left, you have our fragmented care group, which received uh, their radiation therapy at a separate location from their other two therapies. These patients were similar based on age, gender, race, tumor size, tumor grade, and nodal positivity. They had similar rates of surgical margin status at the end of their procedure, and there were no statistical differences between the length of stay following their procedure and unplanned readmission rates. Oops, excuse me. Uh, multivariable analysis demonstrated that there was no difference in survival based on fragmented care, meaning that these patients received uh, their radiation therapy at a separate location than their surgical and the chemotherapy. However, metastatic disease was a significant predictor of mortality in these patients. When we examined long-term survival in these patients, there was also no di difference in long-term survival based on whether they received their care at one versus multiple facilities. Uh, from this, we're able to conclude that for this particular cohort of patients with complicated neuroblastoma, that receiving care at multiple facilities versus different facilities didn't provide a long-term survival benefit, nor did it provide a benefit in readmission rates for these patients. Uh, when we're considering this, it's important to understand the burden that this places on families. And I think that uh, one big conclusion that we have from this is that if we do want to promote consolidated cancer care, we need to provide a strong benefit to the families when we ask them to do that. Um, Thank you for the, the time listening to me here, and I'm happy to take any questions. Your study looked at mortality, but did you look at complications or costs? You know, that's a hard thing to get at in the National Cancer Database, especially the in-hospital uh, complications, uh, and it's difficult to combine databases to get at that. Our uh, hypothesis going into this was that, that we were going to have improved benefits in long-term survival and readmission rates, particularly readmission rates, uh, but that just didn't pan out in the analysis that we were able to conduct. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, hi, um, <clears throat> Jared McIntyre from Anchorage, Alaska. Very good presentation, very interesting. What were your definitions of 
fragmented care specifically? Was it just different institutions or did they have to be separated by a certain geographic distance? Because mm-hmm. I would think that would be a significant contributor to, to difficulty in achieving a you know coordinated care model. Yeah, so uh, what we were able to examine using the National Cancer Database is just separate institutions. Unfortunately, it didn't give the distance between those institutions for us. Um, you know, the, the thing that we've discussed as a group following this study is that if a, a family can receive part of their care closer to home, that one, that's probably a big benefit for them. Uh, and two, it, uh, based on this study at least, it wouldn't benefit their outcome uh, to do it the other way. So I, I think your point is well taken that families should be at home if they can get the, the care. And I think going forward, I'd recommend you not using the term fragmented. Fragmented, and to me, implies poor. And if somebody who worked in a smaller center at first, and then in a larger center, if I'm providing the same care, and the same, and most of it is is prescripted through the COG, I would expect my outcomes to be the same. And I think the final thing is, it's the tumor biology mm-hmm. itself. So yeah. I think the encouragement should be providing high quality, accurate care in the patients, that's what should be promoted, whether they get it at their home institution or at a, a centralized center. Your point's very well taken, sir. That's an important thing to note with the connotation there. And you know, uh, when we did look at our cohort, they did have uh, similar levels of, or similar tumor characteristics when we looked at them. So the biology, you know, even despite that, we had similar outcomes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next talk is the impact of MIC-N status on response of high-risk neuroblastoma to neoadjuvant chemotherapy, presented by Dr. Yanishvitsky from <laughs> St. Jude. Thank you. Neuroblastoma, oh. neuroblastoma is the most common solid extracranial malignancy of childhood. MIC-N amplification occurs in 40% of patients with advanced disease and is a poor prognostic indicator. However, McKen's impact on initial tumor response to new adjuvant chemotherapy remains unknown. We have added the impact of McKen amplification on primary site tumor response, metastatic disease response, and degree of surgical resection. Our retrospective study of 84 high-risk neuroblastoma patients, including 34 patients, or 40% with McKen amplified tumors, we evaluated the degree of surgical resection as assessed by the operating surgeon have been greater or less than 90%. Primary tumor response was assessed by volume change on CT from diagnosis to pre-surgical imaging. An example shown on the left. Metastatic disease response was assessed by change in Curie score on MIBG scan from diagnosis to pre-surgical imaging as seen on the right. In our study, MCAN amplification was associated with younger age at diagnosis and larger initial tumor volume. It's also correlated with a greater percentage reduction in primary tumor volume. Patients with MCAN amplified tumors were just as likely to achieve greater than 90% resection of the primary tumor. MCAN also had no significant impact on metastatic disease per MIBG scan. In conclusion, although MCAN amplification in neuroblastoma is associated with a more aggressive clinical phenotype and poor prognosis, our study showed that MCAN amplified tumors had a greater primary tumor response to neoadjuvant chemotherapy and were just as likely to undergo gross total resection when compared to non-amplified tumors. Thank you. Good study. Thank you very much. Uh, Do you think that you're losing a little bit of your signal in the fact that uh, uh, the overwhelming majority of these tumors are still surgically totally resectable at uh, institutions that do that very often, like St. Jude? Losing the signal that. Do you think that that, do you think that you when you can resect the overwhelming majority of the tumors greater than ninety five percent? and, and therefore your numbers of patients that don't have resection are very low. Do you think that you, it's maybe a function of the, the smaller number, a smaller N, total N, and the high percentage of total, rese- the high total resection rate 
that perhaps uh, we're, 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 we might be missing something because of those numbers? Sure, just because of the modest sample size. Um, yeah, I mean, it was about 83% of patients with mechanical amplified tumors had greater than 90%, and non-amplified, it was also 90%, about 45 of 50. So definitely a valid point. Hi, uh, Marcus Malik from Pittsburgh. Did you take a look also at the amount of necrosis in the spec resected specimen? Uh, it's on the pathology report, but it's not something that we looked at um, in this study. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next is depletion of pulmonary alveolar macrophages inhibits metastatic outgrowth in a mouse model of osteosarcoma presented by Dr. Maloney. Good afternoon. Oop, I have no disclosures. Previous work from our lab has demonstrated that the drug gefitinib, an FDA-approved epidermal growth factor receptor inhibitor, is able to block macrophage-promoted osteosarcoma invasion and inhibit pulmonary metastasis in a mouse model of the disease. Furthermore, we've demonstrated that the effects of gefitinib are independent of EGFR signaling in our hands and are mediated through inhibition of RIPK2, an alternative target of gefitinib that's expressed in macrophages. Because we've shown that gefitinib can block metastasis in vivo, and our in vitro results suggest it's acting through macrophages, we wanted to examine the role of macrophages in the development of pulmonary metastasis in this model of osteosarcoma. To do this, we utilized a mouse model of osteosarcoma where tumor cells are injected into the tibia of Balbsi mice, and at one week, when the metastases are present in the lungs but still small, we initiated treatment with intranasal clodronate liposomes to selectively deplete the macrophages in the lungs. During the course of four weeks, mice either, retreat, either received standard or gefitinib impregnated chow, and at the conclusion of the experiment, the lungs were harvested and the metastases quantified. We first confirmed uh, macrophage depletion in the lungs using flow cytometric analysis, and you can see that in clodronate-treated mice, macrophages were reduced by about 40%. We define these as CD45, F480 double positive cells in the lungs. Here you can see that clodronate treatment had similar efficacy to gefitinib treatment alone in the reduction of the number of pulmonary nodules. However, interestingly, in mice that were treated with clodronate and had their macrophages reduced, gefitinib was not as effective. Histologically, you can see that gefitinib-treated mice and clodronate-treated mice had less metastatic disease when compared to controls. And when we evaluated pulmonary metastatic burden, which we defined as the portion of the lung taken up by metastatic disease histologically, we saw a similar trend. These results suggest that gefitinib is not acting by just wiping out the pulmonary macrophages, but perhaps affecting their phenotype, and that mice that are lacking macrophages in the lungs are not able to have as effective of, uh, you're not able to see as prominent of an effect of gefitinib. So in summary, Pulmonary macrophages are shown to contribute to the metastatic outgrowth in a mouse model of osteosarcoma, and the drug gefitinib is able to inhibit this and may do it by altering pulmonary macrophage phenotype through RIPK2 inhibition. To this end, we've started initiating a phase 1A, 2B clinical trial of gefitinib in um, adults and children, all comers with osteosarcoma, and we've recently developed a canine uh, trial collaboration with some veterinarians at UPenn. Thank you, and I'll take any questions. Dr. Sandler. Yeah, hi, Tony Sandler from DC. It was a very nice study and very well presented. Uh, do you know the phenotype of the macrophages? Are they myeloid-derived suppressor cells? Was it all macrophages? So um, in the interest of time, I couldn't present some of the data that I have on macrophage phenotype. We have been looking kind of at the polarization of macrophages, uh, and we are looking into other types of cells that are in the lungs, including, including the myeloid-derived suppressors and T-regulatory cells. We've shown um, in past talks that the macrophages that are 
um, than the mice that are treated with gefitinib, the macrophages tend to be skewed towards a more pro-tumor phenotype, um, or the treated mice have mac uh, macrophages that are skewed away from a pro-tumor phenotype, and we look mostly at CD206 and MHD class 2 to define that. Uh, and that's kind of been the focus of our most recent studies, really defining the immune uh, environment in the lungs of these mice that are tumor-bearing and treated. Thank you. Thank you. Our next talk is the risk of structural recurrence in pediatric papillary thyroid microcarcinoma. Does microcarcinoma define a very low risk group? Presented by Dr. Warhunsky. Thank you very much, and thank you to the association for the opportunity to present our work. We have no disclosures. So recent guidelines from the American Thyroid Association recommend that adults with papillary thyroid microcarcinoma, which is defined as tumors less than one centimeter, uh, undergo lobectomy. <clears throat> this is in contrast to the pediatric population with pediatric, uh, with papillary thyroid uh, microcarcinoma. Uh, and due to the increased incidence of bilateral multifocal disease, as well as the increased incidence of recurrent disease, current guidelines recommend total thyroidectomy. Despite this, recent analysis from the SEER database suggests that up to one-third of pediatric patients with microcarcinoma undergo lobectomy. Therefore, the goal of our study was to evaluate a cohort of children from our institution who underwent thyroidectomy for papillary thyroid microcarcinoma. <clears throat> And to determine whether this uh, 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 cohort of uh, patients uh, represent a very low risk group, as they do in adults, and would be well served by a lobectomy. So we had 17 patients overall with a median age of 17, most of whom had benign thyroid disease, most were female, and most were white. Looking at the preoperative tumor characteristics, you can see that the majority of, of patients had multifocal disease, two patients had suspicious central lymph nodes on ultrasound, and two patients had suspicious lateral lymph nodes. FNA of these uh, tumors preoperatively uh, revealed that the overwhelming majority had uh, either suspicious or malignant findings. Operative approach included three patients undergoing total thyroidectomy, 12 patients, the majority of whom underwent, or the majority of patients underwent total thyroidectomy with a central neck dissection, and two patients underwent a total thyroidectomy with a modified radical neck dissection. The median nodule size was eight millimeters on final pathology, 29% had multifocal disease, 18% had bilateral disease, and 12% or two patients had extra thyroidal, extra nodal invasion. Uh, a median of eight lymph nodes were sampled. Half of the patients had lymph node involvement. And in review of the uh, genetic analysis of the tumors, we reviewed nine patients for BRAF mutation, and five of them had BRAF uh, positive tumors, 80% of whom had lymph node involvement. In comparing our outcomes of our cohort to a historical cohort of patients at our institution with tumors greater than one centimeter, you can see that the recurrence rates in the lymph node risk group uh, were similar between the two groups. Therefore, we concluded that children with papillary thyroid microcarcinoma are at risk for multifocal disease, lymph node involvement, and disease recurrence. And a significant proportion of patients have a BRAF mutation of whom lymph node involvement is likely. Therefore, we, did, we concluded that pediatric papillary thyroid microcarcinoma does not define a very low risk cohort as it does in adults, and there's a limited role for thyroid lobectomy, and that this decision could be informed by adequate preoperative imaging and perhaps in the future molecular testing. Thank you, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Since 50% of your patients had positive lymph nodes, should they also undergo a prophylactic central neck or modified radical, or what do you think about that? Yeah, absolutely. I think if there's any evidence of lymph node involvement in the central neck, obviously a central neck, and then if there's any lateral neck involvement, uh, they would require, uh, and our institution uniformly performs a modified radical neck. Question? Peter Liebert, New York. Did any of the patients have any pre-existing thyroid problems that might have pointed towards uh, a uh, malignancy? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. The vast majority of our patients had benign thyroid disease, so uh, close to 80% of whom had Hashimoto's thyroiditis, and in fact, that's how these tumors were discovered. Dr. Aldrink? Hey, Jenny Aldrink with 
from Columbus. Um, were all these diagnosed preoperatively, or were any of them diagnosed on the pathology specimen? It is a yes. It, most were diagnosed preoperatively based on uh, ultrasound findings, but they underwent ultrasound mostly for uh, related to their benign thyroid disease. Uh, some were diagnosed uh, postoperatively as a surprise. So would your recommendation then, if you did a lobectomy and then the pathology returned as PTC, that you would do a completion? Is that it, your practice? Yeah, it's certainly a consideration, and I think the, the, the among many factors to consider certainly would be BRAF mutation and obviously any lymph node involvement, and then obviously discussing with the patients if there's evidence of Hashimoto's disease, it, it might be very difficult to surveil those patients. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, and the next one is prophylactic perioperative platelet transfusion for thrombocytopenic pediatric patients leads to higher postoperative platelet transfusion volumes without reduced risks of bleeding. Presented by Dr. Hess. Good afternoon. Uh, thrombocytopenia is not uncommon in our pediatric patients, particularly our oncology patients and our bone marrow transplant patients. Pediatric oncology recommendations call for preoperative platelet transfusion to achieve uh, certain levels prior to minimally, or ma uh, ma minimally invasive or major procedures. We noticed, however, that platelet transfusions are not always effective due to sequestration or refractoriness, and platelet transfusions have potential negative effects. Several years ago, we asked our um, oncologists and bone marrow doctors not to pretransfuse our patients before operation with the goal of giving them platelets at the time of anesthesia induction. Their variable compliance with this recommendation allowed us to look at the difference between the two groups. <laughs> so our hypothesis was that abstaining from preoperative transfusion but transfusing an induction of anesthesia will result in lower transfusion volumes without bleeding complications. We did a retrospective chart review looking at uh, our pediatric general surgery patients and examining bleeding complications, transfusion volumes, donor exposures, transfusion complications, and the effect of transfusion on platelet levels. There were no bleeding complications in either group. There were no transfusion complications. The patients who were preoperatively transfused overall got much higher, or got a significantly higher uh, volume of platelets. Um, a regression analysis demonstrated that pre or, uh, platelet transfusion does not reliably increase platelet levels. And interestingly, we found that patients who were not preoperatively transfused actually got less platelet transfusion over the ensuing four weeks um, by about 60 milliliters per kilo and had 13 fewer donor exposures. For every one mil increase in preoperative platelet transfusion, there was a 3.8 mil increase in postoperative transfusion volume. And for every platelet test that you check, there's a 2.7 mil per kilo increase in postoperative platelet transfusion volume. So in summary, abstaining from preoperative tr transfusion was not associated with bleeding risks. Preop transfusion increased the volume of platelet transfusion and increased donor exposures. And transfusion did not reliably increase platelet levels. Preop transfusion was associated with more aggressive transfusion practices for at least four weeks postoperatively. Thank you. Question. Did you look at any functional platelet studies, um, TAG and looking at maximum amplitude or something, or any of those types of studies? We, we didn't because of the retrospective nature of the study, but that's, we're, um, we're gonna do a much larger retrospective look at pediatric and adult patients, and then we'll, we'd like to look prospectively. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll go back. Um, our next presenter, outcomes after local therapy for liver metastases in patients with favorable histology of Wilms tumor, a single institution study presented by Dr. Heaton. Good evening. I'll be talking about outcomes from local therapy for favorable histology of Wilms tumor liver metastasis. Um, in Netwits 4 and 5, 15% uh, of stage 4 favorable histology Wilms tumor patients had uh, liver metastasis with a 75% five-year overall survival. All those patients were at diagnosis. Uh, the metastatic site had no effect on event-free survival. Uh, upfront resection had no impact on event-free survival, although there was a slight trend. This was explained by the authors as selection bias. Uh, the uh, radiation and, uh, of, to the liver also had no impact on event-free survival, although Dr. Ehrlich and his co-authors uh, admitted to that this uh, analysis was done on low numbers with inconsistent radiation dosing. 
Uh, whole liver radiation therapy has not been uh, universally accepted uh, because of the early reports of uh, long-term toxicity. The cumulative hepatotoxicity originally reported with dactinomycin is now greatly reduced by modern chemo dosing schedules. And the nephrotoxicity uh, toxicity surrounding tissue and risk of second secondary malignancy can also be greatly reduced by modern uh, radiation techniques such as M IMRT. Uh, our institution treated 11 patients with favorable histology Wilms tumor over the last 25 years. Uh, four of these patients presented with liver meds diagnosis and seven presented with metastasis at, at relapse, which pretended a worse prognosis. Overall survival was uh, uh, 50, uh, progression free for survival was 52% and uh, with a median four, point, uh, four and a half year follow up. Uh, four patients had resection and whole liver RT. Uh, three patients had whole liver RT only and two patients had resection only. Of the six patients that underwent surgical resection, three had multifocal disease, two patients underwent hepatic lobectomy, and one patient had a, a grade two bile leak after hepatic lobectomy. There's no effect on progression-free survival. Uh, whole liver radiation therapy to 19.5 gray was uh, done in seven patients, six of whom had IMRT. Seven, all seven of the patients had nausea, vomiting, and fatigue uh, during, and one, and sorry, and four patients had grade one hepatotoxicity during treatment. All of these problems resolved after radiation. There was no long-term toxicity and there was an improved overall and progression-free survival. Uh, so in our opinion, liver metastasis is a field effect and requires whole organ therapy. Um, our small retrospective single institution study shows that whole liver radiation therapy to 19.5 gray appears safe and may improve overall survival. We hope it can serve, serve as a basis for uh, larger prospectively stratified clinical trials that are necessary to answer this question in the future. Thank you, and I'll take questions. Dr. Langham. Max Langham, Memphis. Uh, Dr. Eaton, thank you very much for bringing this to us. Do you have uh, follow-up data on the patients? Specifically, is there any information that you could give us about the um, uh, portal hypertension um, in these kids later on? So the, the longest follow-up we have in any of these patients is 10 years, um, and that the, there's three patients now out uh, past five years. None of them have any reported uh, problems with their liver enzymes, uh, portal hypertension, or other uh, liver or other liver related problems. But I, I, I can't give you that 20 year data that we all need. I think it's an interesting question. We've, I've seen several patients that had significant portal hypertension after um, higher dose liver um, uh, radiation and perhaps getting a collaborative together to look at that question would be helpful. Yeah, it'd be, it'd be nice to get higher numbers of a standardized dose of the liver radiation because the most of the studies that we have out there have a very variable uh, dosing level given to the liver, and most of them were were done were uh, written before modern techniques such as IMRT. Thank you. So that concludes the session. Thank you to the presenters for doing such a great job, and thank you.